usually hands waving everywhere and everything of the sort. So, yeah. Um, I'll just jump right in. If you don't get that website, it'll pop up a bit later as well. So, um, who am I? Uh, my name is Ian. Uh, I've been in geospatial for about a decade now, maybe a little longer. Uh, I've worked for places like Lens, um, Geographics, College of William and Mary. Uh, in 2020, I started my own business called XY Cardo. Uh, and then in 2021, um, Dragonfly Data Science picked me up to do some LIDAR processing and the relationship went really well, so I've been sticking with them ever since. XY Cardo's on the side. Now it's more of an art map business, so if you want to spend lots of money on a beautiful visualization, give me a call. <laughs> or if you want to spend lots of money on data processing, give Dragonfly a call. Um, okay, so what's the goal here? Um, I should probably start this off by saying that um, this isn't about a battle between vector tiles and raster tiles and different web formats. Um, in my line of work, uh, I need all different formats to get data onto the web. I, need, I still need raster tiles today. I, I need vector tiles for some things, and more and more we're using cogs for different things as well. Uh, there, one's not better than the other. Just each one has a different job. So why we're here today is that the raster tiles themselves are getting pretty old in the tooth, and that's mostly around the software used to build raster tiles has been out of service for about a decade. Um, I'll get into that and why that specific format, well, that specific tool was so important in raster tiling itself. But just know that what I'm gonna demonstrate here is a new method on how to get something like a raster tile but hack a modern format to get these data visualizations to work on your websites or you give you files that you can pass around that act like raster tiles, but they are going to be cog tiles instead. So in this room, um, how many people know what cogs are? Okay, I'll explain them in a second. How about raster tiles? How about vector tiles? Okay. And what we're going to do is basically talk about how to take the, the concept of raster tiling with multiple zoom scales, and we're going to crush that into a cog file. Uh, I'll go real through, uh, quick through the terminology because I think most people um, are familiar with most of this. COG Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF is the one that people seem least familiar with. Uh, this is a normal old GeoTIFF that has some internals on it that make them run really well on the web. Most notably, they're internally tiled and uh, they are, they're internally tiled and they have their overviews built inside of them. So thank you, Abby, for explaining overviews to the room. So uh, I won't have to go through that as much, but basically they're these TIFF wrappers that have something like a raster tile built inside of them. Tiles, when I use tiles, I mean just the individual tile images like a single raster tile. Tiling is the art of cutting these things into tiles and zoom scales. Tile matrix, is anyone here familiar with tile, what tile matrix is? Uh, in web mapping itself, tile matrices are actually quite important and quite vital. They are how the web browser, like, or how the client open layers understands what scale the image is at, what zoom level it's at, and what the resolution of that image is. I'll show an image of it later, but the tile matrix is really how you control the zooming in and out on um, web application. Blending, when I talk about blending, I'm talking about all those operations that you get in QGIS, uh, like multiply, overlay, soft light, hard light, difference, all these things where you're bringing pieces of data together, you're changing the color values to get some type of new visualization. Best example in our field is when you take a hill shade and a, um, a raster gradient of an elevation that you've colored and you multiply those together and you get something that looks sort of like what you see in the image there. Uh, and when I say client, client, I just mean Google, Safari, if you still use that, if anyone still uses the Microsoft version, I'm surprised. 
uh, and Firefox and things like that. Uh, last is serverless. When I, when I talk about serverless, I just mean my data is sitting on S3. I have a web application built. Sorry, <laughs> microphone keeps moving. I have a web application built over here. That web application is just contacting the S3 bucket and, and grabbing the data. Very brief history, um, just to understand the context of where we're going. Uh, Rash tiles came out, I think around 2011, 2012, development seed uh, started using them well. They're also known as slippy maps. Um, they, they ha raster tiles were really innovative at the time. Uh, you could take all your GIS data, you could mash it together into beautiful visualizations, and then you could cut those visualizations up into, two, into 256 by 256 tiles, and then you could do that for each zoom scale that you were building. Um, very robust. Uh, huge drawback, though, is they take forever to render. And uh, New Zealand at the 1 to 500 scale, I think a long time ago when I calculated, it was 600 million tiles, if not a billion tiles. Um, th those kind of numbers, when you're uploading onto S3, get very expensive because you're getting these get requests of 600 million. If you screw up, you have to do the whole thing all over. Um, the other drawback to raster tiles is they're dumb. Um, they're just RGB images that are coming in. They're a PNG or a JPEG. So if you try to click and query on it in your web browser, the only thing you're going to get back is an RGB image. It's not going to tell you anything about the data. Uh, there's a specific reason for that. Um, but if you also think about it, aerial imagery is dumb that way too. And uh, I'll get into how aerial imagery actually got us to this method. Vector tiles came along, they sped things up. They take all your vector data, chop it up into little tiles, and all they do is serve those raw tiles to the client, and then you make a bunch of rules in, in the client. And the client does all the heavy lifting. It does all the colorization. Um, all your widths and everything and handles, all that stuff. Uh, they're very fast to render and they're very, well, they're highly compressible. So they're real easy to stick in tiny little places and they surf fast over the web because they're so tiny. Major drawback of vector tiles is they don't work with raster data. You have to work with your raster data separately on the side. Uh, the other issue in my field is that vector tiles don't have blending functions in them. You, in order to get the blending capabilities, you actually have to do it in the client. Uh, and for anyone who's done web work and done blending in the client through the actual CSS in the client, it is infinitely slow and will drag a process down so, so it's unusable. So we had these two, and over the years, um, We've been working with a bit of both, uh, raster tiles more for slow moving data, uh, vector tiles for data that's moving much quicker and you could get them in and there was a nice balance on it. But the problem is, is raster tiles uh, were dependent, the, the building them were dependent on tile mill. There, there were other pieces of software out there, but tile mill was really the one that was the premiere, but that went out of service in 2016. Um, and I know, I, I can't tell you how many Dockers I've built just hoping that I'm gonna get one more year out of this piece of software. But we noticed that we needed a change. So we started to look at the COG format. The COG format um, is a way to get raster data online and make it work kind of like a raster tile and also get the raw data value to come on, come into the client. And why that's important is if you have something like sea surface temperature data, you can make a cog out of it and you can serve that cog directly online and users could query that sea surface temperature data directly in their browser and get the actual value of the data back. It's a huge advancement um, in how rasters are handled online. And we've been, I, I've been looking at this for quite a while and how that could be used. But the only problem that I've faced with COGS up to this point is that they only work on one piece of data at a time. And they're not really well supported with multiple projections online. Outside of um, on online environments, it's perfectly fine. Uh, so COG almost got me there, but it didn't quite get me there. So 
I started to look out and I, I really wanted these blending capabilities back and I really wanted to get nice imagery back online. Um, I like to create things that look nice, but it's not just because of that. It's because raster data needs to be blended at times and our clients want something where raster data is blended and we're actually creating these nice frames for data to go up. Um, so why not try and look for a new method? And why not try and look for a new method that has well-supported tools well off into the future? Uh, and it looked like the COG format has finally come around and has enough support at this point that we can actually do it. So, what are we doing? Basically, we're taking a QGIS project that we've developed with zoom scales, everything that you would put inside of a QGIS project, all your blending functions, all your roads that are getting bigger and smaller, and all the things that you want to do in QGIS. We're building that into the QGIS project, and for the short of it is we're taking that project and we're jamming it into a single image file where all the zoom scales and all the zoom rules are handled, that you created in QGIS are handled inside of that single file now. So for anyone who's hit the website, if you've been zooming in and out on it, what you're actually looking at is one single file that is internally tiled with all the zoom scales that are uh, built into the cog tile. Um, this is just the basic process. QGIS, PyQGIS is kind of necessary for this process, although we'd like to get it out uh, to help people use it more, but right now you need a knowledge of PyQ, just GDAL, everyone seems to know what GDAL. Um, you could stop at GDAL. If you want to get it online, you're working with a library called GeotiffJS. Um, OpenLayers works well with GeotiffJS now, but uh, I think Leaflet does too, so it's not a big deal. A little more in depth, build a QGIS project. This is the QGIS project for the image you were seeing there, and this is just everything that went into it. Um, it has all the colors set, it has all my gradients set for my rasters. I'm using five or six different rasters in there, which you wouldn't be able to do with a, a vector tile setup. But anyhow, we're in QGIS. Build your project, make it look nice, do all the things that you want to do. Second thing you want to do in QGIS is set all your zoom rules. Um, QGIS is really difficult to set zoom rules, but once you get the hang of it, um, it's like driving a Formula One car. Like once you get the hang of it, you won't crash, but it takes a lot of learning to get right. Um, Q just handles uh, setting your zoom scales uh, based on scale. Um, and what you're seeing there is just like some basic zoom rules for the roads. So as you zoom in, the roads are just getting wider um, as, as you're zooming in and uh, maybe changing color along the way. Once you build in, uh, and also remember that I'm setting those four scales now. So once you get that whole project built, there's a function inside of QGIS that actually allows you to export that image with all the things you could possibly need. Um, if you're going, if you're going to do it manually, uh, up in the top left corner, there's something called save map as image. What this save map as image function allows you to do is set a scale, set an extent for that scale, and set a DPI um, that you want that image to be exported in. It's great if you want to take a picture of your map, but this is, you can also manipulate this in such a way that you can create individual zoom scales, well, images for your individual zoom scales as you're coming out by manipulating the extent, the scales, and the resolution DPI. So where do you get those numbers from? That's where the tile matrix actually comes back in. So when you make that export, we have this thing, it's called a tile matrix. And I wanna thank Lens actually for uh, having this up for years and years and years. Jeremy Palmer put this up and I probably hit it once a month because I can never remember these numbers. But when you're working online, the top zoom level for NZTM, zoom zero, is at a 32 million scale. It has a pixel resolution of 8960, and that is zero. If you go back and look, 
all those numbers could be fed directly into that. And then you would have an extent that you would set. And then you could feed those numbers in. And what you would get is an image that would come out at the 32 million scale with all the rules that you had set for the 32 million scale. If you go down one more, you go to the 16 million scale, you add those in, you export that image out of QGIS. When you export that image out of QGIS, it's going to have all the rules that you set for the 16 million scale. So on and so forth. I'm not going to go through the whole, whole thing. Here's the trick on how to get it all together into a single file. There's a quirk in GDAL that's existed for years and in QGIS that has existed for years. And it's th this particular overview structure. In GDAL and in QGIS, overviews can read overviews of themselves. So if you create o an overview of an overview, you just add overview and then you keep going on and on and on. You set this structure up to be your tile pyramid. So. 50,000 scale, that's your base scale. I think um, uh, we, we were talking about this earlier. Well, Lynn, Abby was talking about this earlier with Lynn. That's your base scale, that's your highest resolution. You see on here, that 50,000 TIFF is at, has a resolution of 14 per pixel, and then I have the extent set on it. The next zoom level is the one to 100,000 scale, which is that overview level. If you want that 50,000 scale to read, the, the next overview up, just change the name. Just give it the exact same name and it'll, it'll automatically read it. But the next overview up is actually at the 100,000 scale. And you can build these stacks of overviews just like this. At this point, actually what you could do is you could just load in that 50,000 TIFF into your QGIS as long as you have all the overviews with it and it works like a normal overview file. You can zoom in and out and as you're zooming in and out, your things are changing. Um, according and based to all on your zoom scales. Is that the right direction? So why did I even do this in the first place? Well, one, I wanted to get the functionality of, of raster tiles back. Raster tiles allowed me to work with multiple sets of raster data to build for web web applications and to be used in different places. It was gone out of tile mill. Even in the past when I used tile mill, I was always using QGIS to draft out all my projects. And then I was taking all my rules and putting them into QGIS, I'm sorry, into tile mill and then creating the tile mill project. The tools are there and the functionality is there now. So the, the point is that all this is available, it's just a matter of restructuring on how we use it. I got my blending back. Uh, I got my scale changes back because sometimes I just want a base map and I just want to be able to hand it off to someone and I don't want people to query the data and I don't really care um, what's going on underneath apart from the visualization. The frame of the data is what was important for the story to the client so they could put all their data on top of it. Um, Huge difference between raster tiles and this is that what you're looking at here is the 50,000 scale. I'm sorry, um, a cog tile of all of New Zealand that would eventually go down to the 50,000 scale. It's one tile. For me to get to the 50,000 scale on the raster tiles, I think was six or 700,000 tiles that had to be um, built. Uh, Probably the big one, and I debated on throwing out this whole presentation and talking about cross-platform, is that this is actually a much better way, in my opinion, to take your complex QGIS projects and jam them into a single file, get all the compression down, and then you can just hand that off to someone. You can pass it to them through S3, you can pass it to them on, uh, online. Uh, it'll work just fine. You just load the file, you load the CogTIFF directly into QGIS, and it zooms in and out. Um, unfortunately, I think this is a better uh, live presentation. Anyhow, where have we got to up in this research and project? I can get to the 50,000 scale. Honestly, I can get to the 1 to 5,000 scale, and I can get to the 1 to 500 scale, but I don't have the space. Um, I've been doing this all on a local machine, and I had about 300 gigs of space. Uh, to work with, and I think to get New Zealand, all of New Zealand, and when I say all of New Zealand, I mean New Zealand within the EEZ, down to the 1 to 500 scale would probably take 
in processing about a terabyte of space that would be needed, but then that would all be compressed down into about, I'd say about 20 gigabytes. Uh, and then those files would be split up. Um, we have most of the process automated now. We have PyQ just running a lot of stuff, and then we have Bash and uh, all these other bits. Um, but it's odd automation based on me setting it off and knowing where, how to run these processes. We'd really like to get a bit for, uh, further beyond that. We're working on something like VRT-like delivery of these COGS online. Um, what, what we're finding is once we get past the 50,000 scale, you can't use one COG anymore. You actually have to use uh, about eight COGS. Um, and if you want to load all those COGS online, um, you have to load all eight of them on. So what we've been doing with these COGS up to this point is as they're sitting on S3, we also have these VRT files that we sit on S3, and we actually call the VRT files uh, from QGIS directly uh, directly to S3, and then it brings the top level of data back. There, there's something in GDAO called VizCurl that will allow you to do this. We figured since we already had these VRT documents sitting up in S3, why wouldn't we just call them in? So right now we're working on a, um, a JavaScript library that parses VRT docs to uh, pull the data in, uh, in, into the web client instead. Um, VRTs are just XML documents, really, so they're, it's not that complex for, the, for those to figure out. Uh, and we have the serverless. Um, all the data just sits on S3, and the nice thing is, is all my web applications I can build off of that library, and that data can also be loaded into QGIS, and anyone within our organization could download the files locally if they wanted as well. They wouldn't have to have an internet connection. Uh, future of this. Well, rendering is very slow. Um, it's slower than what raster tiles were, and I attribute that to user error. I'm not a very good PyQGIS writer. Um, I can script and I can do all sorts of stuff, but man, PyQGIS is just voodoo to me. It's, I don't know if anyone's written in it, but it is hard to figure out. Um, but I think that we could, uh, we, we know the bottlenecks in um, getting the image export out of QGIS and we're wondering if there's a way we can write the code better to actually uh, solve that problem. Um, I did have a talk with North Road a little bit about bringing Cardo CSS language back into QGIS. Um, Cardo CSS is a really simplistic way to set zoom rules and zoom scales and all sorts of different things. North Road seemed interested, um, but they gave me some figures on funding, and I know my company's not going to spend all that money for my dream, so I might have to write it myself. Uh, but if anyone would like to take on that challenge, please do. I'd be more than happy. Uh, eventually, we'd like to make this as a QGIS plugin where you build your QGIS project, and then you hit a button, and what pops out the other side is a cog with all your zoom rules and everything in there. We're, we're trying to get to the one to 5,000 scale, but I have to keep convincing my boss to, I'm gonna spend a, some money. And if you, anyone's ever fired up an EC2 with a terabyte drive sitting on the side, it's, it's expensive. Um, and no, no one's very happy about that. We might split it out. I, I, I don't know how it's gonna work, but that's what the future is gonna be. Um, GDAO support would be really good in the future. When I present this in Fiji, I'm probably going to make a stronger call for GDAO support. Um, GDAO, right now, COGS and custom projections have this weird relationship. Sometimes they work and sometimes they don't work. Like if you have external overviews but you set one wrong setting, the external overview won't be going, gone in if it's in a custom projection, and that kind of leads into the second one. And I think that's it. That was really quick. Might have been confusing. Just some quick thank yous. Dragonfly really didn't have to support me on my research on this, but I came off a big project and I've been hoping to work on this for about two years and they said, have at it till your next project comes up. They are saints for doing that. North Road, um, they, they let me poke them with a few questions about PyQGIS. I was really annoying and they were very kind. 
Evan at GDAL, same thing. I poked him with some really uncomfortable questions, and he was very kind to me. I want to thank Linz at Blaine, uh, Blaine Chard at Linz, actually. He has a lot of work up uh, open on tile matrices, creation, and explanations, and that really helped a lot. And then we had a couple chats, and he was really helpful. And also OSGO, one, for getting me in on this presentation. I was a latecomer. And two, and what's most important to me is I work in open source. I'm a huge advocate of open source. I would not be anywhere without the people that sit in this room in this community. All our work builds off of each other, and we should all be very proud of what we do and how we support each other, and we don't try and cut each other's throats to get more business. That's it. Questions? I think everyone's hungry. I, I think we're all good. Ben